Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home office with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. <laughs> and uh, uh, good to see everyone again. Just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to the channel. Please uh, follow us on, on social media. And um, if you're new to the channel, you, you may not know who I am. Um, I'm co-founder of this podcast. Scott and I started this a long time ago. And um, I don't know, uh, maybe five or six years ago, 18, we started. I think we started recording in eighteen. I think the first episode started to drop in early nineteen. And then, and it was audio only for a while, and and now it's you know we've been on YouTube for a while. But anyhow, about I don't know, eight, nine, ten months ago, something like that. I took a hiatus. I'm I'm busy with some other obligations. So um, I did jump on an episode not long ago where we interviewed our friend Mooch, who was a who was a f- former member of the Mongols MC. But other than that episode, I really haven't been on in the last eight, nine, ten months. And so um, I'm going to try to appear a, a lot more often. And uh, the, a lot of the quick hitters will still be Bernie, but um, I'm going to try to appear as often as possible and get back to our normal routine, cover different kinds of, of groups, different kinds of topics so anyhow thank you for uh you know uh, sticking with the show and bernie and benny keeping things going and putting out a lot of great content so anyhow thanks for being here good seeing everyone again um we have a pretty exciting show today speaking of when we used to do the audio podcast only we recorded an episode a few years ago where we did this like state of the mafia what was it 2020 state of the union like for the mafia like 2021 yeah. or whatever and so we did this around the horn where we talked about the different families and territories. And I would ask Scott, okay, each family, would you say they're thriving, um, semi-active on life support, defunct? We had a whole kind of like category thing. It was a very popular audio episode, by the way, but we've never done a video version of this. So that's what we'd like to do today is do this uh, kind of just around the, the country, uh, briefly look at the different territories and families and, and get these updates, see what Scott thinks. Uh, are these families still thriving, very active, kind of in the middle, maybe on the way out, or maybe just they don't even exist anymore? So, uh, Scott, where do you want to, to start off with for this discussion? Uh, and we'll start with New York, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip through uh... – the admins that we know for the five families uh, in New York City right now, and then, you know, kind of go from there. So let's start on the west side, the Genovese crime family, uh, Barney Belomo at the number one spot, uh, Ernie Muscarella, uh, number two, number three, I'm told Patsy Perello, but in all three of those, you have kind of acting uh, mouthpieces for those individuals. Um, so right now, Danny Pagano is the street boss, but I'm being told that uh, he's going into retirement probably at the end of this year, It'll probably re- be replaced by hippie, uh, Zanfordino. Uh, then you have Mickey Ragusa, who's Ernie's guy is acting underboss and uncle, uh, Pasquale Falsetti, uncle Patty, who's kind of acting conciliary, not kind of acting conciliary for, for Patsy Perello and then uh, Ralphie the Undertaker Balsamo uh, finishing up a prison sentence. He'll probably be in a halfway house by early 25. And I'm told that th- there'll be some combination of him, Ragusa, Falsetti, and uh, Hippie taking the family into the future. Um, Columbo's shout out to Jerry Capace, who was able to you know, the OG Don of, uh, of Mafia reporting in America was able to, to give us uh, who the new bosses or acting bosses last summer, little Rob D'Onofrio, uh, keeping the seat warm for uh, skinny Teddy Persico, who was the heir apparent. He'll be coming out in a couple of years, taking the top spot. We're not sure who the underboss and conciliary will be going forward. Um, Benji the Claw Castellazzo was the underboss. He's in his mid to late 80s, uh, just finishing up a, a prison sentence. And then you got the conciliary, uh, Big Ralphie DiMatteo. He's 68, 69. I'm guessing he'll probably stay conciliary. Um, but great reporting by by Jerry um, in, in locking that down for us. Uh, little Rob, old school Brooklyn guy, 
goes back to the days of uh, Wild Bill. Was a wild was was a Persco guy. Was a Wild Bill guy. Was on the uh, Cotolo Arena side of the war back in the '90s, and then flipped over to the Persco side. Was longtime Capo, very respected, um, low key, mild mannered. Uh, Gambinos. You got Lorenzo Menino as the street boss. Italian Dom Sheffalu is the overall godfather there. Um, underboss I'm reporting is Lenny Di Maria, real OG, um, beloved across all five boroughs, very connected, very savvy, and um, somebody that kind of keeps everybody's temperature down, knows how to kind of uh, play the both lines between the Sicilian faction and the Gotti faction. Uh, of of the of the Gambino, it's not that there's ever been a real rivalry. They were kind of the one faction that the Sicilians started underneath, you know, the Gaudis. Um So, but uh, conciliary. What do you um, mean, what do you mean What do you mean by that? I mean, the Cherry Hill Gambinos go back to Castellano and even before. Well, I, yeah, obviously, I'm not. I'm not saying that. Uh, what What I'm saying is that all of the Sicilians that are running the Gambinos right now started off. It, in one form or the other under the Gaudis. Yes, Lorenzo started with the Cherry Hill Gambinos, but eventually he was put into Jackie D'Amico's crew, as yeah, was Frankie Boy Cali, yeah. Dom Shuffalo. These, these were all Gaudi guys yeah. at one point. Um, Jerry Capace says that Menino is conciliary and acting boss. I don't believe that's true. Uh, Mickey Boy Paradiso was the, was the last name conciliary, another kind of rough around the edges, gaudy guy, older dude. Um, not positive, but just wanted to kind of give everyone. I heard he was he was a guy that was it was a good idea to have him in that position because precisely he was a guy who did does get along very well with both the Italian Americans and the and the Sicilian guys. Yeah. So um, I, that's what I've heard, too. Uh, moving over to the Lucchese's, you have a, um, kind of a generational shift happening right now. Uh, Vic Amuso, the old time little Vic, uh, Vic the Terminator, has been in prison for 30 plus years. He's still the overall boss. Big Mike DeSantis is his acting boss. Um, but it looks like Georgie Neck Zapola is being groomed to take over as boss. He's the street boss right now. Um, under this is a shout out to John Panisi at uh, his channel. He reported um, that Frankie Bones Papagni and OG Boat Barada were in the admin. I have them slotted as underboss and conciliary, respectively. I was the first one to report last year that uh, Boat was back in the mix in terms of advising Big Mike DeSantis. But um, looks like Georgie Neck will be the will be the guy that's taking this family into the future uh and then finishing off with the bananos mikey knows mancuso a uh, boss johnny joe spirito underboss acting boss acting underboss ernie aiello um and the new conciliary i'm told is anthony bruno indelicato um who's slotted in there Vinny tv battle of many i'm told has kind of stepped away into semi-retirement and Indelicato has come into the admin to mend fences. Um, I'm told with, with the Cameranos and uh, members of uh, Vinny Bastiano's uh, loyalists and his, and his family. That's where we are with New York city right now. So New York is still thriving. We would say of, of all the uh, crime families left in the United States, maybe the, the Columbos, I think uh, you could make an argument are, probably have the least amount of made members um but otherwise you would say the other four families are still i think when teddy and when teddy comes out you know it's been there's been a lot of um attrition and and uh changeover in colombo administrations um even when Andy Mush Russo at the very end, I'm told that he was uh, not all there uh, and that dementia had started to really kind of 
sink in at at the end of his reign and that it was difficult to keep that family functioning at the level they needed to function at with with uh, mush russo uh kind of losing it at the end and little rob's a place placeholder great placeholder you know from what i'm told kind of the perfect fit for that job but i don't know if it's fair to judge them um i think we got to take a wait and see approach let's say five years from now six years from now after teddy uh has been out and and gets a hold of the family which has been you know in the making for decades that it is that teddy was probably going to take the family after it became known that little alley boy was never coming home so i think that there's some like mitigating circumstances in that in that regard but I would what say Genovese, the- Gambino, Lucchese, Bonanno and, and Colombo are, are, are at the bottom. But I think the Bonanos are kind of both of those families, I think, are are trending upwards because I think they've, they've gotten the ship straightened. And what about the Di Calicante, Di Calicante family in New Jersey? Any, any yeah. sense of what goes on there? Are they are they still around? Charlie Ears uh, is the boss, uh, Charlie Majuri. Um, I know, uh, uh, Pino and, uh, Phil Abramo are guys that still hold a lot of esteem, Louis eggs, Consalvo. Um, I, I, I don't know a ton about them. It's probably the one crime family in America that I'm least versed on right now. So, and I, I have a couple sources, uh, uh, Charlie, the hat Stango is out of prison now. Shout out to Giovanni, uh, Roca. Um, friend of the program, and I know Charlie's back in the mix, but uh, that's all I can write. Yeah, <laughs> Charlie Ears, yeah, Charlie Ears is an old guy, so I guess the question is who comes in after him. Well, we've talked to Giovanni, the you know he's former law enforcement uh, undercover. His his sense is that it's still an independent Borgata, uh, you know. Oh, it, it, no, it's it is still, still fun. I don't think it's they've they've always had a a um been in this kind of um challenging spot of like the five families to the north and then or what would be northwest whatever i'm trying to think of my geography and then um uh philadelphia to the south um all trying to uh, all taking a piece of the pie in north jersey they've always had a sort of uh, uh a very challenging position would would you agree with that yeah for sure but the, I, I would never uh say that right now they're even close to being absorbed or Okay. I would say they probably have 30, 40 May guys, probably. I mean, maybe I'm overshooting it, but I, yeah. I don't think there's any question that they got a uh, um that the um the ranks are are uh, are flush, at least yeah. from what I've understood. Um moving into Buffalo or out to Buffalo, up to Buffalo. You know, if you follow us, we do a lot of Buffalo talk, so but we don't want to get too in deep into the weeds here, but I'm told that Joe Pizza, Joe Tadaro Jr., the reputed uh, godfather there, is the boss, never been convicted of a federal crime, uh, denies any involvement in the mafia, we should say that. Um, but uh, he's the boss. He's come back in the last 10 years, from what I'm told, and 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 re- restructured the family, got them um, back off life support, and... Um, and and refueled um injected the ranks with with new blood and new direction made uh overtures to new york to get back on terms with the uh on the five families and is working in from what i'm told buffalo is working really close with them working really close with canada the underboss don violi who's from hamilton first canadian to be a administrator in a american crime family um conciliary i guess is still kind of up for debate. I've been told uh, Vic Sansonisi, but I, I don't have that. I don't have that confirmed. And so Buffalo, um, it's interesting. You still have some people that um, say this is all, um, you know, the, the the trial, the the dead witnesses. Um, it's all coincidence. Uh, the fact that the people on trial are Italian American, that that witnesses are turning up dead. It's all coincidences. This yeah. is all in Scott's imagination. There is no mafia in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's, you're, you're you're aware of like that critique yeah. is out there in certain spaces. And it's interesting how the the, internet, the, main, right? the mainstream media in Buffalo uh, reports on it. Um, they're very um, 
reticent to say the word mafia or mob. They say Italian organized crime. Um, yeah, which, which, what does that mean? What do you think? It's a Camorra? <laughs> they don't like, <laughs> and they don't up? like, I mean, whenever I mention Peter Therese Jr., I'm always mentioning who his, who his uncle is. They, they don't really do that <laughs> very much. Yeah. Um, so they're covering the case really well. I'm not taking anything away from uh, Buffalo uh, News does a great job uh, blow by blow in the courtroom and and uh, their their television affiliates. They, they cover the machinations of the trial very well and the cases very well. They just don't give a lot of context in terms of um, mafia links and they're <laughs> whether or not how deep those mafia links are, I think are up for debate, but you can't debate that this is linked in some way, shape or form to the mafia in Buffalo. I mean, that's what the federal government's told you that, that that's, there's been a concerted effort to go after Italian organized crime in Western New York over the last five, six years. Yeah. And even the stuff about the violis, I mean, that all came out during their own legal issues. And I think the out of Canada that came out of right. the RCMP. Right. And so, um, I mean, I guess if you if you're still one of these like you don't think Buffalo is a real is an actual mafia family anymore, then I, what are you saying that they were lying that the Violis were lying about well, that? And, I mean, I, in in those filings in the RCMP filings, they they break down for you what allegedly Joe Tadar Jr. has done to get the family back up in right. uh, moving at a, a higher clip that he is they've talked about who he's dealing with in New York City. I believe one of the informants said uh, that Porky uh, Zancocho was his um, go-between. Porky is or was uh, Mikey Knows Mancuso's conciliary before he got deposed in the Bananos. And now I'm told that a uh, uh, Colombo, Vinny Ricciardi, Ricciardo, sorry, Vinny Ricciardo is a go-between for Buffalo and the five families. So it's uh it's, and there was also there that for, came out in that mean. that investigation that Violi said it's not like who is going to be the underboss. It's just there's only five guys left. Five guys left. So I he guess he beat has out to thirty be guys. Yeah. yeah, which which was you know probably might have been an exaggeration, I would think. But the point is that uh, the, the implication of that is there are multiple members of this Borgata left. That if it wasn't just uh, you know you're yeah. underboss by default because there's only four guys left. And a made guy, no, whether Gervase Jr. is a made guy or not is up for debate. He's he told said he people, was, at least he's right. told people he's bragged about being a made guy. We don't know right. for sure. At what we know for sure, though, feds. what we do know for sure is that Mike Masessia, a.k.a. the gorilla, a.k.a. high school football coach slash made member of the mafia, according to the government, is in prison serving seven years right now for drug trafficking. He's been identified as a made member of the Magadino crime family. So, yeah. And his names come up in, in the Jerez Jr. case. So, yeah. uh, again, you guys, you can do the math yourselves. Um, going over to Philadelphia, or one of my favorite places to play in the, in the sandbox that is uh, the Bruno Scarfo crime family. I, w- I wish we had more um, cemented knowledge this is also a time of transition, I believe, for the Philadelphia Mafia. A lot of controversy re- related to uh, longtime boss Joey Merlino. I do believe right now, in terms of title, he has it, uh, that Joey is the boss in title. But I think that's all it is, that he has stepped away from any day-to-day management whatsoever, um, and that he is merely – a titular head right now uh, that the family is being restructured both because they've realized kind of the error of their ways and they were being leveraged by New York, the Genovese and the Gambinos. Um, So I think Georgie Borghese is still uh, acting boss, but more of a full boss now with Joey no longer really from what I'm told, uh, Joey's not chiming in anymore. He's, almost being shifted to a quasi conciliary where he's um, welcome to, to chime in with his advice and counsel, but he's no longer final say that's, this is what I'm being told other than having the title um, that 
Uncle Joe Legambi um, is back in. Uh, this guy can't. He can't retire. He's tried to retire like you know, five times in the last twenty years, and he he keeps on being um, brought back to to troubleshoot. Um, you know, he's helping smooth things over, from what I can understand. Um, and Joe uh, Mousy Massimino is going to be or is the underboss, what I'm told, is is fully back immersed in, in the day-to-day uh, operating of the crime family, and that possibly uh, Anthony Stano is going to be taken over as conciliary when Legambi finally is able to step away. Uh, Mikey Lance is street boss still, so he's kind of Georgie's guy uh, day-to-day. And then Stevie in prison, Stevie Mazzone is somebody that uh, everybody trusts and loves and could come back as the boss, could come back as the underboss, could come back as conciliary. He's definitely going to come back in four or five years in some administrative role. So does that bump one of those other guys out then? Well, those guys are getting, you know, uh, Legambi's in his 80s, Mousy's in his 70s. Um, some of these guys might just want to retire. Stano's, Stano's been out of the game for 10 years. He's tapping back in. Uh, from what I can gather, allegedly, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see. But it, it was it was a rocky road this last five six months. That that, from what I'm told, it has finally stabilized at least on the end of the organization. And we'll we'll find out w- what was behind the arson attacks uh, at Joey's uh, cheesesteak spot at some point soon. I'm guessing, and we can kind of take it from there with uh, where he stands. What about uh, New England? So New England, uh, the Denunzio brothers got control of the patriarchal crime family. Um, I believe they're 66 and 65, respectively. The big cheese, Carmen Denunzio and his brother, Anthony Denunzio. Um, Little Eddie Leto out in Providence is the underboss. And I believe the consigliere is uh, Spucky Spagnolo. (sighs) Out of... uh, Revere and as somebody that's helping uh, Anthony Denunzio uh, run the family day to day while uh, Carmen Denunzio is kind of the final word behind the curtain and uh, little Eddie and uh, good looking Maddie, Googly Maddie run, uh, run the Rhode Island wing of, of these operations. So they would be captains. Eddie's underboss. Uh, Maddie's a capo. He had been underboss, uh, and because of health reasons, he he stepped down from the underboss role, went back to a capo, and Eddie Lato stepped into the underboss role. Uh, we know that based on Rhode Island State Police reports from last year, or the year before. And and would so would you say the Patriarca family is still um, yes, thriving. I don't know if I'd say thriving, but they're they're very very. Uh, I'll say right now, I think they're I think they're thriving. The Denunzios wow. are bringing in new blood. Wow. Um, they've gotten the Connecticut operation back, um, uh, back to where they want it to be, allegedly with Eddie Perret, uh, alleged with their alleged new. Yeah, he's not he's not a made guy because he's not fully Italian, but from what I understand, he is the uh, pseudo skipper. Um, him and, and Mario uh, Grasso. But uh, Eddie Perrette and Mario Grasso. So I think um, I foresee a case coming uh, at least down in, uh, into Providence soon. And I think we'll learn more about the state of that organization um, when the feds come with that case. But maybe they never will. Just But there's been a lot of rumors over the last year that uh, they've been building a, um, a, a narcotics and racketeering conspiracy. Uh, case that, to, to try to bring and that some of that's been reported right that's not just it's all yeah it's, it's no it's yeah. it's been reported in mainstream uh, media yeah, there i thought so yeah 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 so uh move over to chicago um solly d salvatore de Laurentiis, uh still the godfather in that kind of tony accardo role um albivina the falcon is still the street boss but well, Solly's a, a Cicero guy, Lake County guy. Um, Alby is a West Side Grand Avenue guy. P- 
power has moved out of Elmwood Park, where it had been for a long time with the DeFranzos over the last, let's say, five, six, seven years, and is now kind of like fully cemented in Cicero with this this group of, you know, I've called it kind of a uh, a street gangification in some ways of the modern day Chicago mafia, where a lot of these up and coming shot callers in, in Cicero guys that are loyal to, to fat Mike Sarno, the former boss that's in prison will be coming out at some point in the next five, six, seven years. Uh, they all come from street gang backgrounds, 12th street players in Cicero. A lot of them. It's like, it's like a feeder group. Yeah. Uh, kind of what the, the C notes used to be or the 42 gang or, um, these kind of J, JD mafias that, that by design the crews from the different territories don't really like commingle and right. like associate with each other, which is by design to like insulate. Except right now, Elmwood Park and Cicero are almost one group, but they're still two separate groups. I think when Rudy Fratto finally passes away, Elmwood Park will roll into Cicero. But right now, everybody from Cicero and Elmwood Park are kind of one group that all hang out uh, at Capri Lounge. Uh, it, it's a, if you want to see those guys, that's where you go. Uh, West Side guys, um, Albie and those guys used to be at Richard's Bar. I'm told that um, Albie isn't there as much anymore. You could find him there every day for a long time. Next to La Scrollo, that was uh, right at where, you know, where Milwaukee, Grand, and Halstead all kind of come together. Uh, it was Joey the Clown's stomping grounds. Uh, Southside, kind of a, a younger group coming up under the Carusos. Uh, little Frankie, Tootsie Babe's uh, son, and then old, the old boss, Joe Ferriola's son, Nikki Spoons, Nikki Ferriola, um, are running Southside on a on a day-to-day for, for Tootsie Babe Caruso, I'm told. And then... Um, you know, Cicero's where the power is. So you got Sammy Catadella, uh, Catadella who's the underboss, and uh, not positive who the conciliary is. Rudy, you know, for all intents and purposes, Rudy Fratto is the number, th- you know, number three or number four. He's a lightning rod. People either love him or hate him, but he's got a whole faction of that, or he's got a faction of the family that's still loyal to him. He's officially a captain. Like that's his official. Yeah, Elmwood Park, and then he's got some crew bosses underneath him: uh, um, Gary Gagliano and uh, Tony uh, Doty, Bobby Abinati, those type of guys. And Christy, Christy the Nose Spin is still around, um, number two in in uh, on Grav on Grand Avenue. It's an OG, you know, Joey Joey Lombardo's old driver. Um, so you know, Chicago's. In good shape numbers wise, I think it just will be interesting to see how this kind of less a cardo racketeering and more wild bunch from the seventies, I think will be like, these guys are not polished racketeers. They're more gangsters. So it's, it's almost like going forward is going backwards in some ways, but we'll see. I mean, I know a lot of the guys, these relatively younger guys, guys in their 50s, early 60s um, in, in Cicero are all very capable. All these guys are tied into the police departments, into the different municipalities, just like it's always been in Chicago. Um, a lot of dope. A lot, a lot of the cocaine that's being um, consumed in uh, in Chicago right now, I know, has has some significant ties to the outfit. So. Well, Chicago is uh, a choke point just overall for the whole nation. Yeah, I, I think it doesn't surprise me. I mean, that I mean, almost all the cocaine anyone's consuming in Detroit right now is coming through Chicago. Yep. Whether whoever it is, blacks, Latinos, Italians, whoever, bikers. I mean, every just cocaine is it's just a major choke point for cocaine distribution across the United States. And then there's some uh, we can go to Detroit right now and I'll, I'll make the segue from Chicago. There's a a group of guys under Solly D who I would consider zips in Chicago. Um, so I think some of the future in the Midwest is you're going to see more of a, a old school uh, overseas um, 
Sicilian style um, from, from, from both groups having more influence going into the future. Solid these guys, who I, I don't want to mention their names, have never been uh, convicted of any crimes over here. Um, but they're they're of some prominence. They're and, imports from from. Yeah, and guys from, that are very uh, uh, big earners, and guys that people are very afraid of. Um, from Sicily or from southern Italy, or we? I'm not. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, I I'll do some more research and, and let you know. But yeah. I know their names, and I know a lot of people know their names. But we don't want to. Yeah. We don't want to uh, bring that up. Uh, in Detroit, I feel more comfortable talking about the Zips because they've been um, indicted and convicted. Uh, the Dana brothers. Joe Dana and, and his brother Mimo. Uh, but the boss is still Jackie Jackaloni, Jackie the Kid. Pete Toko recently died, so they have to replace him. Uh, the underboss in Detroit, I'm told, is Chicago Tony Lapiana, one of the most stealthy American mafia figures in the history of La Cosa Nostra. Yeah, he's a ghost. He is definitely a ghost, um, but incredibly powerful and well-connected around the country. Um, so the question becomes, like, what does the new administration look like? I've heard Joey Giacalone's name, longtime capo, could slot in. Um, I've heard uh, Jeannie Boy Barada, Eugene Barada, another name, um, again, alleged. Uh, he's a, a prominent businessman in, in Detroit who uh, has been married into uh, married into the into the crime family, married Joe Zerilli's daughter, or sorry, uh, Tony Zerilli's daughter, um, Joe Zerilli's granddaughter. And... Uh, He's a name I've heard as a possible administrator. And then uh, Jackie's old driver, Davey Aceto, gave you the donut. So uh, we'll see how this coalesces. I think the Danas are going to are gonna keep gaining power um, and that over the next decade, this family will kind of go to them, honestly. Uh, we'll see. But I, I think that the, the Sicilian faction of the Detroit mob will eventually take control of what's left of the old Tocos really structure and it, it will become more transnational. Well, and in a way the the family's always been a Sicilian family, except for uh, the Jackalones and their guys are always, I thought of as more Italian American, even though the Jackalones were Sicilian American, by the way, I mean, they were from Terracini, their family, but you know what I'm saying in terms of, um, they didn't have the ties to Sicily like the Toco side did, with which because Toco and Zerilli were always close to Papa John Preziola mm -hmm. and Jimmy Quasarano, and those guys kept those those relationships. Uh, uh, Cesare Battalamente, th those guys kept those ties to to Sicily. So um, it's interesting if that if that's still the case that that kinship and these transnational ties are still are still important in in Detroit. Um, just, you know, three more places to hit on Two, just real quick, Milwaukee and Cleveland, they aren't your traditional LCN structure anymore, but I do believe there's LCN activity that are left in both cities. Milwaukee at this point is we've talked about it on our, on our last episode is pretty much a branch of the Chicago outfit at this point, Cleveland, from what I can understand is being shared by Detroit and Chicago. Uh, they have a little bit more of a structure than Milwaukee does, but not much. Um, again, you can kind of debate what defines a mafia family, what's left, what's not left. But there are made guys, I think, in both uh, both cities. Uh, in Cleveland, we have you know a boss left in R.J. Papalardo. Um, but I, I don't think that they're really functioning on their own. Yeah, the question becomes boss of what? <laughs> right. What are they the boss of? But I will say the last family I'll hit on, Kansas City, I think word of their demise is considerably overhyped. Kansas City is still around. I don't see them going anywhere. Yeah, they don't have a ton of made guys, but they got a lot of OGs um, that are left. I mean, not a, when I say a lot, I mean more than one or two. Uh, Johnny Joe... Shorantino is alleged to the boss. Las Vegas Pete Simone alleged the underboss. These are guys that go all the way back to the Sevillas, guys that are suspects in multiple mob murders, big earners with ties around the country, um, very respected. I, I've kind of said that these are kind of like the guys that run Kansas City are almost like 
East Coast style mob guys, New York or Boston style mob guys that just happen to be in the heartland. And that's their mentality. And that's my understanding idea. from talking to our friends like, you know, um, Gary Jenkins, who's been on our show, and is that a lot of the guys underneath these, the, the few Italians that are left, it's more like a multi ethnic. It, it doesn't yeah. look like a traditional what we think of. Everyone has to be Italian, like so. They're not necessarily inducting new guys, but you got like you, Irish dudes, Latino dudes, black well, dudes, Mon- like you know, working underneath these guys. Pizza Mon's kid, uh, Joe Pete, is allegedly you know the youngest made guy. He's in his fifties. I'm told that he he handles all the younger generation guys. Uh, Vinci Black, uh, Spoda, Shoda um is finishing up a prison sentence for arson he'll be home by probably by the time he's 75 i'm guessing he will be the successor from what i hear to johnny joe in las vegas p and vincey black has been in prison for about 10 years and i've been told is politicking a lot uh behind bars and has set up guys in kansas city with some other families uh, to do some work um including philadelphia in in terms of the Midwest, um, would you? My sense is that other than Chicago, that might be the exception. But Kansas City, Detroit, I I, I think it's going to be difficult. Like in terms of like guys in their twenties and thirties, I, I don't think there, there are, are none. guys left. There are There's none. Not a lot of guys left that in terms of being recruited for the next, like. Um, I think in Chicago that that that's probably still going to ha- be happening for a while, but I don't I don't see it in in Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Kansas City. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, we'll see what all these families look like in ten years. Like I said, Cleveland's pretty much not a family anymore. I think yeah. officially, I would say they're still a family. Um, uh, you know, techn- technically speaking, but they are. If it wasn't for Detroit and Chicago, they would not be standing as a as a. From what I can and, and the the one the one way around that, of course, uh, this is just total speculation on my part for the for the record, um, is the Im- importation of guys yeah. from the other other side. That yeah. that's the only way you can get over and, the fact that guys in their twenties and thirties just aren't aren't interested in in being part of this world. And Kansas City is really tied into Chicago as well. I know that uh, Elmwood Park and Cicero have, have a guy that goes there. I don't monthly basis has a place there and uh represents them there so this was fun and uh what about salt lake city (laughs) (laughs) we'll break down the denver mafia the atlanta mafia the seattle mafia that will be our next episode yeah so and just and just for the record tampa new orleans st louis done you would say done i think there might be a mate guy or two left in st louis i don't know what I don't want to speak to it. I don't know. Yeah. What they what that Los means. Angeles is is an interesting case study too. Oh, because, LA. We did we forgot about LA. I, LA is still standing. Because Tommy, we know I, Tommy Gambino and and just, you know, for people that have a problem with that, he's been identified in in federal government investigations as as a as a Cosa Nostra member. He was identified as the underboss at one point of LA. So we're not just that's not speculation. That was in the federal, you know, federal investigative um documents. And um so it's interesting to think of whether or not um, those names that you hear out there, are they just New York guys who are operating in LA or are the actual remnants of a Dragna, well, uh, Milano, both. Licata, There's, both. there's an active Dragna crime family there. You, I believe. You're, say, you're, you're comfortable saying that, that there's still yeah. remnants of that left. Okay. I wouldn't say remnants. I'd say there's a structure. I don't think it's a big structure, but there's and you some think, structure. You think, you think, Tommy Gambino is he's in yeah. that not he's not just a New York guy. Operating. No, but I think but also believe that each crime family in New York have representatives. They still have guys out there. Yeah. In L.A. Yeah. Because that's know. always I, been the yeah. case. Yeah. I mean, going back to yeah. Joe Isco, what, Ronnie Lorenzo. I mean, those are just two names that, you know, uh, that are, are prominently thrown out there. Uh, yeah. Ronnie. Ronnie's a, the Bonanno guy. Isco's a Gambino guy. Donnie we, Shack. Uh, Donnie Shacks from the from the Columbus was out there for a while. We've had people like you, you had conversations with, with Tony Zerilli and we've had Michael Francis on our show who said that when and then their experiences in LA, you could basically, if you're from another family, just basically go out there and operate 
Yeah, plant a flag, uh, and you weren't going to get bothered. Right, and they, and you, you usually you got to communicate diplomatically with the with the local borgata, and we've heard from a couple of you know former heavyweights that uh, that you could just go to LA and basically do what you wanted. So I mean, I don't know that's only two sources. That's a small sample size, but they're they're you know they're some couple of heavyweights that that I think have some real insight. So I don't know um, you know what what that what that means for today, but I think it's kind of interesting. LA, I think is we, we should do an LA episode one of these days i think i think it's a it's one of those kind of interesting uh because you got all the different families there you got jewish gangsters back in the day mickey cohen as long as you Uh, have a boss we've said this as long as there's a boss yeah according to you know the the official or unofficial lcn you know manual yeah that that was put forth yeah put forth uh, when it all started you you know as long as there's a boss there yeah there's a family yeah that family's still recognized yeah even if it's even if it's just one guy left yeah well, thank right, you, Jimmy. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was fun, and uh, hopefully it was insightful, informative. So uh, thanks. I'll try to uh, jump on more episodes, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing everyone again. You uh, share, please, share, follow. like, subscribe. Yep, and it's help spread the word, and we'll see you guys soon. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, Jimmy B, out.